What's the story? Nothing much. Just been a had a pretty busy day actually. Nearly got uh, nearly got caught by the trains actually. It was uh, oh loads of delays. I mean the Scott Rail service is terrible. So, but what's new? Yeah, <laughs> the competency crisis. Supposedly the train drivers here are getting paid between sixty and eighty thousand pounds now per really? year. Really? Yeah. Couldn't believe like it. A decent salary. Yeah. I, I I couldn't believe it when my father told me that. Uh, supposedly all the strikes here have pushed their wages way up. Even even starting salaries, you you may be starting between twenty five and forty thousand. And then after yeah. three years you're you're up to like 50 and then after that you know it's you're making the bigger bucks but when once you're they you know, private are they bus, private uh, it's in a weird sort of gray area you know that public private thing but yeah it, it is meant to be private yeah it was privatized they like virgin or something like that no 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 a uh, scott rail scott rail so it's the it's the actual national, though it is private, is the national rail uh, service. Mm. Yeah. It was really bad today. I was on the train to Edinburgh, and for some particular reason, it seems during the day now, they, they, turn, all, they turn off all the lights in the cabins. So you're right. going through the, the tunnels and it's pitch black. Uh which is just, you know, one of those little symptoms of the decline, I guess, or the competency crisis. But yeah, it's Try, weird. Trying to save a few quid. Exactly. Well, you got to pay the, the high wages of the, the train drivers, so. Yeah, but that, that seems like a very good salary for, for, what, for what they're doing. I know they're doing an important job, but like, for example, by comparison, I don't think a, like a police officer would be anywhere near that type of salary. Oh no, no. the The salary for police officers in in Britain is actually severely low. Yeah. In Scotland, it's extremely low as well. Yeah. Uh, I I have a few friends who are they they are they are well. One of them's in the police force, and the others in G four S, which mm. depending on you know uh, where they're contracted out to, they they may act in that that capacity, but. Mm. The, the G4S is okay. The police are oh, they're they're terrible. But for a normal constable, I, I don't think you'll get anything over maybe twenty five thousand a year, maybe twenty seven. Mm. So you're making just the average salary, mm. which of course is is going to get you nowhere, in in terms of owning a house, a car, mm. family, all of that. That'll get you nowhere. So, yeah. But G G4S was. Uh... Originally G four, no. With some connection there with Margaret Thatcher's husband, I think. Mm, I believe so. Yeah, yeah. That rings a bell. Yeah, because I, I remember when I worked briefly in the Irish prison service, and the talk at the time was privatisation, and um, I believe the prisons in the mm -hmm. UK, in Britain, some of them anyway, are if not all of them, are they have, you know, um, private sector prison officers. Mm -hmm. But I think I remember that name G four as you say G four S, and I remember Thatcher's husband or late husband maybe now, mm -hmm. uh, coming into the the conversation around the ownership or he was one of the major shareholders at the time or he, he definitely had some connection with him anyway. Uh, yeah, most likely. I, it's interesting now because it's owned by a private equity firm called Allied Universal. Uh, Universal. Uh, right. Oh, sorry, no, it's a private security and staffing yeah. company uh, based out of Pennsylvania and Irvine, California. But interestingly, their logo is the obviously the Saturnian ring, which is ah. quite uh, popular. Uh, that that uh, sort of stylized uh, ring. Saturnian ring design is quite popular amongst the corporate branding. Uh, uh, one of the guys I work with, he's former. He was he was former British Army, but he went on to contract in Iraq as a private security for uh, American engineers, which mm -hmm. I assume was 
probably right after the Operation Iraqi Freedom, after the kind of combat phase of that operation died down, they probably had to get the engineers in there to rebuild bridges or get the roads sorted or whatever, you know, but he mm-hmm. was in as a private contractor. <clears throat> um, well, they make crazy money. Yeah. Funnily enough, that's what, when I left school, that was that's what I was looking to do. I was going to go right. down the path of the army, then pri- private contractor, mercenary, essentially. Yeah. Uh, not because, you know, I wanted to play Rambo or anything. I, I knew they made a lot of money. Yeah. And at that time, you know, it, it seemed like, oh, all right, well, it's the sort of idea of, you know, joining the army to get out of the working class and uh, or get out of the area and see the world and all of this. But in, in many ways, I'm glad I didn't, you know, given the everything we saw through 2020 I mean you would have I would have been forced to uh, partake in the madness as well yeah well I'd say de- depending on where you were on on in the food chain you may or may not have had to partake in the madness because I'd say if you were well got and up up the chain of command and positioned you know in a snug mm-hmm. secure way you may not necessarily have to I've had to, you know, click your heels together. Oh no, oh no, absolutely not. No, there's, there was a, a a guy I knew in in our class and in high school. He was, he was quite, you know, he was quite rebellious. He wasn't necessarily, you know, a, an A class student by any stretch of the imagination, but he he ended up going to Sandhurst. Yeah, he really stuck in the last couple of years in school, and ended up going to Sandhurst. And uh, yeah, he sort of jumped up the you know in terms of social mobility, he jumped up the classes quite a mm. bit. I mean, he was I always see him on Facebook. He's sort of hobnobbing with the uh, you know the the Oxford you you you, you know the toffs, the Oxford toffs, and, yeah. and all of that. Uh, but yeah, he's he's always traveling the world as well. I don't think he took the vaccines either. Is he like he he's told, an officer? Obviously, officer. I believe he's a, a commissioned rank. a commissioned officer. Yeah, I believe he is a commissioned officer. Well, would they be on a decent salary? Y- yes, I, I, um, oh god, I looked into it a few years back. Yeah, it's a fairly decent sat. Don't get me wrong; it's not as good as the train driver. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's a fairly decent salary. I think it's between, I think the starting salaries um, for a commissioned officer is something like forty, forty-five thousand, which is okay. Yeah, it's not too bad, considering the the UK government on their their website .gov UK, they were a few years back. There was a bit a bit of a stink up where they were advertising. Uh, an astronaut position, you know, working mm. directly for the government for only 40,000. And you had but, to be bilingual, of course, in, in English and in Russian. So, right. <laughs> there you go. And of course, to be to become an astronaut, you actually, you, you have to have a PhD, you know, mm. number of, a number of years in research institutions, all this background experience. And for that, you got 40,000 a year. You know, so it's. Do you need to be? Uh, I I remember, like at one point in history, astronauts were, you know, headhunted from the Air Force. I believe the earliest phase of recruitment, like back in the day in the sixties or whenever, um, U.S. Air Force, NASA, for example, recruited from. So I remember reading a little bit up on, the, on this. They were recruited, I think, through Langley back in the day, and when they recruited for the, the first space programs, like, they had no, like, they kind of had to make up the HR rules, like, as to how do we actually go about recruiting, who do we recruit, or who mm-hmm. can qualify for the program. So I think they had to go through, you know, the fighter pilot type airmen and look for suitable candidates and kind of try, try and devise a recruitment program, like, literally an interview type you know, weeding out guys that might be less uh, effective or whatever, but they, um, 
So, but but the point being, I think they had to, they had to be pilots as such. Whereas now that may not be the case. You know, you could probably be an astronaut, as you say. You could be a PhD in I don't know atomic physics or something like that. And because I'm assuming most of these people are like kind of systems engineers, you know, maintenance. You yeah. know, they maintain yeah. a system rather than a lot of it's to do with the ISS. So even if we assume the official story's correct, yeah, a lot of them are engineers. They, mm. you know, of course, there will be a diversity of backgrounds and aptitudes because mm. on the ISS, assuming they they would have IT systems as well there, so you you'd have to set up that, and of course, every single one of them would have to have media training to some degree. Right. They would have to be. Not necessarily photogenic, but they would have to to be at a certain level in in terms of um, uh, presentability in front of a camera. Yeah. You know, mm. I want I wanted to go over this article that well, actually, it it really has informed my ideas surrounding the competency crisis, yeah. and it's from June the first, twenty twenty three. It is, on, it is from a, an art, a website called Palladium Governance Futurism. It's by mm. a gentleman called Harold Robertson. Mm -hmm. And the title is Complex Systems Won't Survive the Competence Crisis. And right. I was going to go through this article with you and just get your take on some of the uh, some of what it discusses, you know. Uh, I've, I've, posted, I've posted the article uh, if you want to have a read yourself, but um, it's to just begin. At a casual glance, the recent cascades of American disasters might seem unrelated. In a span of fewer than six months in 2017, three US naval warships experienced three separate collisions, resulting in 17 deaths. A year later, power lines owned by PG&E started a wildfire that killed 85 people. The pipeline carrying almost half of the East Coast's gasoline shut down due to a ransomware attack. Almost half a million intermodal containers sat on a cargo sat on cargo ships, rather, uh, unable to dock at Los Angeles ports. A train carrying thousands of tons of hazardous and flammable chemicals derailed near East Palestine, Ohio. Air traffic control cleared a FedEx plane to land on a runway occupied by a southwest plane preparing to take off. Mm -hmm. Hydrox contaminated with antibiotic-resistant bacteria killed four and blinded 14. While disasters like these are often front-page news, the broader connection between the disasters barely elicits any mention. America must be understood as a system of interwoven systems. The healthcare system sends a bill to a patient using the postal system, and that patient uses the mobile phone system to, t to pay the bill with a credit card issued by the banking system. All these systems must be assumed to work for anyone to make even the simplest of decisions. But the failure of one system has cascading consequences for all of the adjacent systems. As a consequence of escalating rates of failure, America's complex systems are slowly collapsing. So I'll stop mm. it there. Do you, do you have any... Um, well, of course, we were speaking about this on the last call. Uh, your your experience from the construction industry, which seems to parallel mine as well. So, do you want to speak to that and maybe how it ties in with the the competency crisis and these the breaking down of yeah. these complex systems? Well, I suppose on on the on the macro, you could start off by kind of summarizing this kind of dynamic that um how do i say it you know it's a controlled demolition you're 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 trying to undermine society and trying to undermine the systems and um basically bring in the rot so things things aren't working as they should be um but it seems to be like as you said from the construction point of view um, how would I say it in summary? Like one angle on it potentially is um, privatization and con contract workers 
where accountability may not necessarily see everything is post structural so no organization in the holistic sense um is familial has has a mother father and you know uh, offspring workforce that work coherently together as as a unit anymore because uh, like in in a unipolar kind of monopoly type world there are no organizations in competition with each other anymore perhaps so you could probably take an angle on this on the automobile car manufacturer kind of uh, example where lately i've been looking to potentially purchase a new car and like you know you realize that the ford has a peugeot engine the toyota has a you know a renault engine uh, Jaguar has a Ford Mondeo engine and so on and so forth. So nothing is what it says on the tin anymore. And w- what you may infer from that is that at the corporate level, everything hinges on where where the next buck can be made. So, you know, if, t- if that means that Toyota will ally with Renault to bring out a new product, a new car, van, then so be it, because at that moment, that's where the hot ticket is to make the next book. So in the old world, perhaps those those manufacturers were in competition with one another for a slice of the, of the market. Whereas in the unipolar monopolized, you know, c- corporate global mega monopoly, there's, there's not necessarily competition between entities, uh, corporate entities or company type structures anymore so what all that's remaining is where are we making the next book so all these uh names for example of companies well we don't have to limit it to companies we can also expand it to like national governments um the lines are blurred between them really because behind the scenes it's just shareholders moving money uh, money around from one source to the other uh, for example, if we use the ex- the example, for example, the, the Toyota van has a Renault engine, so it's not really Toyota. And if we try and graft the example onto the, uh, you know, nationalist political government uh, sphere, we can we could say, for example, in Palestine, that the senior leaders in the Palestinian movement are not actually Palestinians; they're actually Israeli Jews. So. The Toyota is not really a Toyota. It's a, it's a kind of a hybrid beast that's a coalition of uh, expedient opportunities to, to make money or to, to, to hold power. So to kind of hone in on your, on your central point, somehow in the middle of all this, I think there's a twofold, a twofold, uh, you can look at it from two angles. One is that the advent of bureaucracy and there's a, a, a the, the dumbing down is actually a weaponized dumbing down and it has sprung forth from somewhat from bureaucracy um, because it has tied up the functionality in society for, of, of progress and you're left uh, one of the symptoms of this is this competency crisis that you point to so um, you know, the, the people that are moving up the lines, up through the management spheres, are, are not nece- necessarily the most competent people. And often they are the Machiavellian types that, uh, you know, skin and graft their way up and, you know, they, they dagger their way up or they have, they're kind of, they have their own insidious um, uh, means for moving up, up the line. Or, or they've been promoted as such for, you know, n- not the right reasons. So over time, um, you know, you're left with a kind of a, an incompetent class, as you uh, use your word, managerialist kind of a dynamic within, within the organization. But um, so I don't know. I've kind of lost my train of thought, to be honest with you, after that. Um, well, I, w- I was going to mention, think, sorry, Zil, you finish just, your point. Yeah, just like I think there's also a sort of a an internal 
loss of direction in the West, for example, maybe globally, but definitely in the West. And that's also manifested as a kind of a, a crisis of competency in that the, the direction isn't there that would give rise to excellence, for example. And part of that is back to the, the original point that the, um, you know, in the monopoly kind of scenario, there, there's no competition. And that is a, a fact that that's a kind of a, a fallout from globalism, from unipolarity. So if you looked at it, say, across the manufacturing uh, industry, for example, in any given sphere, you could possibly say that uh, globalism has eliminated, competi eliminated competition. So without competition, you kind of start to head into a kind of a stagnancy. And again, to use a car, that a uh, car automobile analogy uh, of all these companies with different different names under 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 the hoods, uh, you know, it's about the quickest book that can be made. So you know, you buy off another a competitor's engine and put it into your car and uh, so on and so forth. But like uh, in the bigger picture, you've you no, nothing is really moving anywhere, and all of your employees are contractors and they can be moved over to another corporation or company they may contract for someone else tomorrow so there's nothing really steering there's no sort of granular good honest to god brown bread behind any of it like you know it's it, 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 after a while like you kind of end up in the in the bog and i think that's where some of this uh competency crisis as you as, as you say it the whole machine starts to collapse in on top of itself it starts to you know, there's a rust inherent in that because it's not based on anything quantifiably mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, good or valuable. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's the quick book. And as well as that, as I said, the other side is some of it is, is a weaponized approach that's, you know, that's oh, yes. been deliberately yes. used to sabotage uh, organizations, companies, and indeed political institutions, nation states, the exchequer, the economy and so on and so forth and the culture itself so it's it's a wide it, it's a wide and very effective way to dismantle society you know but in summary some of it is 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 the cocaine nostril of the guy on wall street who says buy sell buy sell and somebody explains to that person well you can't because these are two different countries and he he says i don't care buy them both we own everything so to him to that archetypal, stereotypical, perhaps character, he doesn't care. You know, he's he's looking at the numbers on a, on a screen to see where mm -hmm. can he make a profit, and if it if it involves moving the you know moving the blood the lifeblood from one company into another, so be it. In order to collapse, uh, you know, collapse any kind of a competition or or to make to magnify any possibility he has of making a profit, he will do so. So like there's. But it's a sort of an unnatural um, system because it has no competition yeah. inherent in it to, to keep it rigid and to keep it kind of fresh and well, alive. You know? Well, the, comp the competition is to get rid of all competition. I mean, that's ultimately the... Yeah. Um, that's, the, that's the award at, at the end yeah. of, the, of this, you know, sort of endless horizon of, of entropy for the... You know, of course, the managerialists, or we we could say the you know the the bloat driven um, bureaucrat, or even the the the, the merchants, right? The the yob on wall, you know the uh, what was that? Uh, not the yob, the uh, yuppie on Wall yeah, Street, right? Yeah. So, and of course, I, I mean, the the problem is when when the when the sort of outlaw this notion of com uh, competition, they create an unequal society, right? They have to, by virtue of that goal, of that objective, of getting rid of all competition, of centralising all power, which ultimately, that is the main goal of power, to centralise mm. all power unto itself. And what that inevitably does, in every civilization I covered this in, in my first book, and I, I, I'll mention a few quotes here just to you know back up my point is that it destroys any ability for the system to reform 
Mm. And yeah. li- life, the, the lifeblood of everything in existence is adaptation and change, right? Mm. If it is, and of course, this system constantly states change the world, change that, change that. But ultimately, nothing does change because all of the change is corralled, it's funneled, right? It's not necessarily even change. What it is, it's, it's sort of slight innovations that are permitted by this financier class, this managerialist class, because it suits their interests, right? So all mm-hmm. innovation in a technological sense, because there's no innovation socially, all innovation in a technological sense is, is predicated upon them gaining more power or gaining mm-hmm. more profit or both. Mm-hmm. So, for example, we see within uh, the Roman system, uh, just two quotes here. The, this is from um, Peter Turchin's War and Peace and War, The Rise and Fall of Empires. It's a pretty fantastic book, actually. I, I, I recommend it. Mm. He states, quote, The richest 1% of the Romans during the early Republic was only 10 to 20 times as wealthy as an average Roman citizen. Now mm. compare that to the li- to the situation in late antiquity, when an average Roman noble of senatorial class had property valued in the neighbourhood of 20,000 Roman pounds of gold. There was Mm. no middle class comparable to the small landholders of the 3rd century BC. The huge majority of the population was made up of landless peasants, working land that belonged to nobles. What do we see nowadays? Mm. These Mm. peasants had hardly any property at all, but if we estimate it very generously, at one-tenth of a pound of gold, the wealth differential would be 200,000. Inequality grew both as a result of the rich getting richer, late imperial senators were a hundred times wealthier than their republican predecessors, and those of the middling uh, wealth becoming poor, unquote. And we see from that same book, quote, Uh, The set of values developed by the early Romans called Mos Meorum, uh, the literal translation of that is uh, the the, the ways of the ancestors. It's where we get our term mori from, or mores, right? Or mores. Was gradually replaced by one of personal greed and pursuit of self-interest. Probably the most important value was virtus, or virtue, which derived from the word uh, wir, or wir, man and embodies all the qualities of a true man as a member of society. Virtus included the ability to distinguish between good and evil and to act in a way in ways that promoted good, and especially the common good. Unlike Greeks, Romans did not stress individual prowess, as exhibited by Homeric heroes or Olympic champions. The ideal of hero was one whose courage, wisdom, and self-sacrifice saved his country, in times of peril. Turchin adds, unlike the selfish elites of the later periods, the aristocracy of the early republic did spare its blood or treasure in the service of the, did not spare its blood or treasure, pardon, in the service of the common interest. When 50,000 Romans, a staggering one-fifth of Rome's total manpower, perished in the Battle of Cannae, as mentioned previously, the Senate lost almost one-third of its membership This suggests that the senatorial aristocracy was far more likely to be killed in wars than the average citizen. So what what we're seeing there is, again, it's diametrically opposed to the system we see now, right? And also our leadership. Our leadership has no... It has no real stake within, within the society itself. In fact, the only stake that it has in society is to the detriment of society. It profits from the detriment of society. So does the, the financier or merchant class too, the stakeholder class. So you've got this perverse incentive within the leadership to essentially destroy the society for profit and for power and to impoverish people. Um, and f- furthermore as well, could you imagine if we lost one third of the membership of any government body, right, in a war, or in a single, not in a war, in a single battle, and we lost, you know, 
God knows how many, you know, a large percentage of our our fighting force within, again, one battle or one war. The society would it would collapse like a house of cards. It it couldn't take that societal stress, right? Because it's in a late stage of entropy, a late stage of decay. Mm. And like what you're saying, everything within the society seems meaningless. It's mm. uh, it, it's totally demoralized and atomized because again that destroys any potential competition to mm. the clearly uh, ineffective and largely out of touch and hubristic uh, leadership that we have currently, mm. you know, the, the top 1% and all, you know, the likes of those. So ultimately, what we're seeing is it's, it's a repeat of, the, of these systems, but this, this is where, for example, DEI policy comes in, right? That ties in with this competency crisis. That's something mm. we, though we saw it within Rome, you know, a dilution of the, the ethno-cultural landscape, we didn't see it as systemically as we do now in the West. Mm. And he mentions as well, there's a move from meritocracy to diversity. That mm. the, the society has shifted its, its values, its um, primary objective from meritocracy to diversity. And it's, it's very interesting when you see that, because it's not necessarily from meritocracy to nepotism, which is what we see within Rome and all of these other civilizations, but it's to diversity. Um, uh. Honestly, of course, it's, it's all artificial. It's like what you stated, it's, it's an artificial collapse of the system. But it's, it's almost staggering that uh. we we have this diversity over just straight up nepotism, right? Over, mm. say, the, the elite of, say, Britain choosing other elite to fill the roles of these, you know, gradually public-private enterprises, right? Mm. Uh, where the lines are blurred totally between, you know, private equity and uh, governmental institutions. But mm. <laughs> we actually see the almost not the reverse of course but it's it's a nepotism but based on ethnic grounds yeah. or what what one could call oikophobia or the mm. the irrational fear of one's own countrymen right mm. um yeah it's it's ve very strange it was very tempting to 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 look at it as as, as a, a kind of a weaponized how do you say like a a sabotage of society because like as you you know as you disable society as you kind of like society w was taught to walk on its own two feet at one point in time but you've put it into a position now where, where it needs a wheelchair you know it's forgotten it's basic basic things it can do so now you you provide it with the wheelchair so it's like you know it is tempting to think of it as a tactical demolition slash sabotage of everything around us that eventually you will engineer a situation where you know the society that had its own faculties and had you know developed its own capacity to to, to sustain itself look after itself mm. its own mm. you know be it lawmakers or engineers or medical class or even military class protect protect itself you know uh, develop legislation for itself, create a robust economy for itself, and you know ensure a healthy, vibrant population with um, you know a decent cultural life and uh, you know a kind of a you know en you know engendering a decent intellectual growth and you know uh, you know a kind of a, a youth youth that that, that the, the younger people in the society will be vibrant and alive in in the true sense of the world word and be kind of moving forward and you'd have a whole culture there of something that was healthy but like instead what you've what seems to be happening is all of that has been dismantled systemically dismantled 
to to the point where the society is now blind, deaf, dumb, uh, paralyzed, and you know anemic, and mm-hmm. uh, kind of intellectually moribund and culturally absent. You know, so you're you're kind of all of those faculties. So now it needs to be propped up. And that's where the trouble yeah. arises because they're they're going to come in with the props, with the um, they're going to inject. Uh, if the society can't do it itself, it it now looks to the system. Well, you know, I need lifeblood, I need direction, I need somebody to show me the way, and that to me would seem to be where the trouble will really begin because, mm-hmm. you know, the 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 cure will be worse than the disease. You know, and that's, you know, this is, again, we've mentioned this in the past. This is one of the worrying, uh, you know, the final, the utopia, you know, the utopia that will be promised will be the ultimate tyranny, you know. Exactly, yeah. And in in this darkest night of the soul, when the society is, is on the floor, you know, in the damp, cold and bound, it will reach out to sign on the dotted line to get it, get itself out of its misery. Mm-hmm. But you know, the worry is that, um, you know, then it, it signs itself into final tyranny. But like, yeah. a, like just a quick aside on that, a potential, um, like you talk about competency, Mr. Lynch, Mike Lynch is bought, uh, capsized in inverted commas off the coast oh, yes. of S- Sicily. I believe it was last week or the week before, but he, like he was a Cambridge, he, there was a competent guy in the true sense of the word who was originally um, an academic uh, in Cambridge University. I believe he was, uh, his area was like probability and mathematics, if I'm not mistaken. So you you probably know a little bit more about the, the Bayesian, is that how you pronounce it? Bayesian? Bayesian theorem? Bayesian, yeah. The ba- Bayes- Bayes theory. A theorem, yeah. yeah. So my kind of just work and Joe's sort of knowledge of it is that um, he, he mentions it actually on a TED talk on YouTube where he was talking about the machine learning essentially in layman's terms is very zeros and ones, very if then kind of um, literally it, it thinks like a machine. Whereas he inferred that Bayes' theorem enabled you to model human reasoning, human kind of subjective reasoning. And what I took from what he said was that the, the you know, the base theory um, possibly gave um, the opportunity to add a human characteristic into the algorithm. So, and, you know, of course, the worrying possibility out of that is that the masses or the, the population at large may not be able then to distinguish the algorithm from human or from an entity with human traits, so to speak. So, but which or whether he was a very, as you he was a competent guy who started his own company uh, in Britain. He's actually of Irish stock and uh, he was quite successful. And um, he's, uh, I believe, you know, after that, it gets all gets a bit shadowy. He sold it, I believe, to HP. Hewlett Packard, and then there's an allegation of fraud that he grossly overvalued the the worth of the company. <clears throat> in in the last couple of years, he was uh, in court, and the case he was found not guilty. Long story short, next thing he's in the Mediterranean, off the coast of Sic- Sicily, on his yacht, and a couple of weeks ago, um, he his yacht turns upside down in the storm and he drowns, and a couple more people on board drown. And his co his colleague, who was also um, you know, on this fraud charge, dies uh, a week or so earlier in a car hit and run type accident. So you could infer, in short, one of the inferences from the story is that perhaps he was too competent for the machine. Uh, you know, as you hinted at earlier on, there you said it yourself, Silas. Um, there's no room for competition. So. At the level of the algorithm, as as we foresee it, as a kind of a centralized algor- algorithm for societal control, uh, you know, perhaps Lynch came up with. Perhaps Lynch knew too much 
or perhaps what Lynch knew or had figured out was too important a thing to be having outside the inner circles. Only the inner circle, you know, should or could have the authority to have such uh, technology or, or insight into technology. So, so perhaps they killed him. You know, he was murdered for that reason. Um, but so there, there's another thing to mention in, in regards to this is that power itself, of course, it wants to centralize all power onto un, onto the the edifice that is it and its system. Yeah. But ultimately, of course, it dislikes competition. But I also Though it may state it wants change, it of course, and, and again, this, this is even at the height, when it's, it's not in its corrupt phase, right? Mm. When the system is still in its infancy, it, it still holds to this principle that it seeks homeostasis, right? It doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't, necess it doesn't want things to radically change, right? Mm. So even if it reforms things, it only reforms the procedures, right? It doesn't mm. reform the principled actors behind those, yeah. you know, putting those procedures in, in, into systemic effect. So yeah. we, we see in Michael Grant's work, it was a short book actually, titled The Fall of the Roman Empire, he explains, there was no room at all in these ways of thinking for the novel apocalyptic situation which had, which had now arisen a situation which needed solutions as radical as itself, the status quo attitude is a complacent acceptance of things as they are, without a single new idea. This acceptance was accompanied by greatly excessive optimism about the present and future, even when the end was only 60 years away for the Empire, and the mm. Empire was already crumbling fast. This is exactly what we see today, right? Progress. We're on the cusp of progress. Right. Mm. Um, Rutilius continued to address the spirit of Rome with the same supreme assurance. Right. Hubris, mm. total hubris. This blind adherence to the ideas of the past ranks high among the principal causes of the downfall of Rome. If you were sufficiently lulled by these traditional fictions, there was no call to take any practical first aid measures, measures at all. So, mm. in regards to Lynch, right. Mm. Um, I'm sure he was a, a fantastic mathematician, st statistician, mm. uh, a, a brilliant mind. Mm. The thing is, this system doesn't want brilliance because brilliance can shine too bright. And of if course. it shines too bright, it shines within this, this darkness, this dark dystopia that the system is constantly, is the only lighthouse here. And us, like the landless peasants, the moths to the flame, do we orbit and, um, you know, gravitate towards this, this beacon, right? This, um, this light upon the, mm. upon the, the, this, this dark, deathly mountain. Mm. So ultimately they don't, they don't want any other, again, competition, anything that shines too brilliantly, um, Beyond does, what they can. Yes. But if something does momentarily shine beyond where, where, where they can, what they do want to do is capture that light and then kill its source. Yes. So, for example, if Lynch, for argument's sake, did come up with something novel and something that was an immensely, potentially immense, immensely powerful, See, this is the thing with the with the with the the kind of blitzkrieg mentality, because you know, lightning warfare, blitzkrieg, JFC, Fuller, and and the Wehrmacht in the German Army, World War Two, were the first statisticians to envisage the use of you know mechanized warfare, and that would completely change warfare on the battlefield, which had before that had been the cavalry horses. So now suddenly you have to think about tanks, motorbikes, jeeps. So it, so they were thinking about technology in a completely novel sense, and they were making up the new uh, tactics and strategies on the spot 
in a, in a very creative way in the sense that it had never been done before. So they, they, they had to, well, what do we do? How do we do this? How do we use this technology? And they thought, well, we're right, what if we do ABC? And people were like, well, ABC has never been done before. And they were like, well, let's just do it. And it brought them t massive tactical advantages, you know. But likewise, if someone like Lynch spots something, you know, with the B Bayesian theorem, how it can affect the algorithm. And, you know, it has a massive consequence, you know, if you, for machine learning, for example, or AI as it's commonly known in the media. They want us to use that term, right? AI. But, you know, perhaps he spotted something. So, so the system, Silicon Valley and its military, political military, like let's say the Silicon Valley is the uh, com computer apparatus of perhaps the global political military economic system that we're all under. So they got hold of Lynch and they figured out, hang on, he's he's onto something. So they you know they let him run up the wing as much as he, space he needs to develop the idea. But, you know, as soon as they've got the, the blueprints, he's a dead man. Because they don't want him developing it beyond a certain point. But they, they still want to kind of uh, grab his idea, you know. They want the blueprints. They just don't want him around in case he sells it to someone else. You know, he's a loose cannon. You can't have a guy like that around who's a real innovator. It's, you know, who knows where he's going to go with that, you know. He, he could use it potentially, you know, let's just for argument's sake, say he came up with something. He could use that for a democratic objective that would be enabling society and people in some way. But that's not, that's not their vision. You know, that's not where they want to go with it. So I think that's why, possibly why he, uh, uh, you know, I have a hunch they killed him, to be honest. And I think that's that's probably possibly why that I don't think it was a simple revenge that he screwed him out of a, a bunch no, of money. No, no, it's never as. I think, is. I think he was too. I he, I think he just was too big for his boots. You know, he got too mm. big for his boots, and um, he knew too much, and possibly he was going to make a move that would be contrary to. Yes. Where they want to go. So possibly he was he was playing hard ball with him, and I think I have a hunch as well. They murdered him. In the spotlight as a warning to say yeah, the, to anyone, like, not only are we going to kill you, but we'll kill you on the six o'clock news, and everybody yeah. will see it, and and will and will kill your uh, eighteen-year-old daughter as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is and that, exactly that's what if we're if we're right. That's if we're right. As I said, I'm just it's a hunch for me, but uh, you know, I see a lot mm -hmm. of the stuff. Um, it seems to be a lot of people are. Um, are well, see enough, if you see enough of this, I mean, if it. it you know, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, then chances are it's, you know, a duck. So, yeah. um, you see enough of this, there's a bit of pattern recognition you can employ. And yeah. nine times out of ten, you know, you're, you're usually correct. Yeah, there's something yeah. about the entire, the entire thing. Absolutely. But there, there's, I suppose, back to your original question about the competency crisis. You know, you, you want, you're kind of monopolizing, um, see, data is one thing, but capacity mm -hmm. and capability are quite another thing. Mm -hmm. Because you can have all the data, but you, but you also need the expertise, the capacity, you need the mind, you need the, the brains to, to yes. run the thing, you know. So, so you need monopoly on that side of things as well. So that becomes super critical, because what you want is the upper 5% you know, from the, you say the managerial class might occupy, say, for argument's sake, 15% of the spectrum. And then the senior CEO section of, of the world occupies the top, say, 5%. But somewhere, anyway, on those inner rings of control, um, all the competency should reside in there. And you should have a monopoly on it. And what you're trying to do is make everything else absolutely weak and redundant. Especially, you know, if you were to follow that line of thinking that uh, the West is scheduled for demolition. 
So you're actively pursuing that kind of uh, mm-hmm. castration. Well, well uh, we see that. Sorry, Senator Jenks. I was just going to oh, say, well, we see that in the military sense too. I mean, yeah. look, for example, what the developments in Kursk, right? Yeah. It's a totally suicidal mission. Mm. I mean, it, it just would never work. And of course, what does it do? It galvanizes the Russian public, even yeah. more so, against the West. I mean, there's mm. actually, there's, there's pundits, social commentators in, in Russia, calling Vladimir Putin a coward. Yeah. Because he's, they're saying that the war's gone on too long now. Essentially, with this Kursk thing, we now need to destroy all of Ukraine, annex it all, all the way up to the, yeah, yeah, the Polish yeah. border. I mean, but this course, this story the, the, is is, is yeah. very very much the Toyota with the Renault engine, mm, the Jaguar yeah. with the Ford yeah. Mondeo engine. The, the, this mm-hmm. whole Ukraine Russia thing, you don't know like. You'd have to keep looking yes. up the hood or the bonnet, as we call it here, every two minutes and ripping off the, the badge of the manufacturer to look under, see, was there another badge? And you're into this kind of caper. Oh, no, I, abs- absolutely. But what, what I'm stating is yeah. they're mili- militarily castrating the West. I mean, what this has shown is that the mm-hmm. West has absolutely, it's, it's military hegemonic status. Mm. just in a, a purely narrative or geopolitical sense yeah. doesn't meet its industrial output or its industrial mm. capacity mm. and it's it's becoming i mean i mean it's it's becoming quite grossly you know observable that mm. the the west is in a total freefall decline it's not just socially in decline and economically and culturally mm. it is in decline militarily now as well which mm. problem it's problematic because you already have brewing sectarian divisions that is slowly metamorphosing uh, metamorphosizing into mm. sectarian politics. I mean, for example, here in Britain, you have places where there's enclaves, ethnic or ethno cultural, ethno religious enclaves, where the <laughs> You know, this part of the enclave may hate the other part and they may inhabit the same city, right? Mm. And the MPs or the councillors or what have you, the officials that they elect from that uh, enclave are all completely sectarian in their values. They represent the sectarian uh, dimensions of their said enclaves, right? Mm. So, again, you're getting a sort of patchwork society. Mm of factions and this mm. again this is leading to the competency crisis because if you the the problem for example here's here's a for, a, a, for instance from history when prussia went up against the austro-hungarian empire when uh, even when the ottomans went up against the the austro-hungarian empire um but most notably prussia prussia had high social cohesion right mm. Every one of them was Prussian. They all spoke Prussian in the military, of course. They all spoke, uh, pardon me, Prussian. They all spoke German. They all had standardized uh, equipment, weapons, and uh, a mindset, right? A cultural mindset. When we look at the Austro Hungarian Empire, which at the time, during the, you know, the various wars in the 18th century and 17th century, they, 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 they sort of, you know, Prussia do, was dwarfed by the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Mm. But the problem is only 40% of the military of the Austro-Hungarian force, or military, um, spoke German, right? Yeah. The majority yeah. were Hungarian. They had a totally mm. different mindset yeah. to, to the Austrians, who, by the way, were slightly made up of Slavs as well. So... Mm. You had this total division, this diversity, and it di- it did not lead to efficiency, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, Austro-Hungary, you know, it lost lost several wars due to that, so, you know, and it ended up collapsing as well because of it. So, you you're, I mean, even NATO is another example. You've got this diversity of military equipment, right? 
Um, it's like what you're saying, you know, the the Jaguar may have a Ford Mondeo engine. Yeah. And yeah. you've got this, this mismatch of parts. But that's, of, of course, the same with uh, society. It, it's not yeah. going to work. It just doesn't work. If you have a, co- uh, you know, a, a draft call for, con- you know, mass conscription, yeah. how, how many people will, will heed that call in society? Mm. Very few. I, I would say none, actually. I would say you would have riots, a breakdown of social order. If they tried to implement a mass conscription of, uh, mm. you know, of, of males at least, you know, of course they, they probably have females as well in the conscription too. But yeah, there's a Sorry, the, there's a bit of the flip flop going on because you know they've engineered a society that you said, as you say, it has no coherent identity anymore. Yeah, because we were led to believe that having a coherent identity was a, a morally reprehensible thing to have. It was bad to have a national identity because that meant you were evil, essentially. So, but the good thing to have was have a, a society that was completely a patchwork of all the different peoples of the world. That was a good thing to have. So, but in the meantime, as you kind of, as you say it there, that, that society cannot, you know, realize itself in any singular identity it can't have a realization of itself in any way because it's too mm. diverse but yeah. uh, you know then you're into the 1984 scenario where you actually exactly. you know you have to manifest these conflicts and wars to keep the whole you, you got to manufacture them they're you know they're just circus act wars where there was no real casus belli you just started shooting People and get over over an imaginary border, um, and you know, give arms to one side against the other, just to have a conflict, to be able to tell the wider society this is going on, just to have something outside the bell curve, to keep you know the reins tight on 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 the horse. But um, like I mean, we've seen. I don't know if it's a good example, but one of the mm-hmm. jobs we're on lately does. It seems to be a complete mess, you know, but, you know, it's a managerial mess. We have Spanish contractors, English contractors, French, Iraqi, Irish. Ah, you name it. Everyone seems to be down there from all over the world. And it's just a mess. The whole job is a mess. Um, on top of the sort of multicultural spectrum, everyone's a contractor. So no one really kind of works for anyone everyone's working for themselves and it's kind of i don't know it's it's crazy down there you know it's absolutely it's dangerous it's, there was a romanian cruise down there everything every you can you can imagine and um it is actually dangerous because you know no one's talking to anyone no one knows how yeah. to get a singular control over the whole thing there's language barriers mm-hmm. like language barriers only start you've got a cultural barrier um, which are even, I mean, you don't have to go to black and white to actually get a culture, cultural barrier. I mean, if you go as far as Spain or France relative to, say, Britain, you've got a huge difference there. And that's, the, that's just the local neighborhood of countries, you know? That's not going down to, you know, Africa or Asia. Or, it's even in the local area we have huge differences, like which impede efficient operation, like, you know? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and, uh, but and I, also, I, I read, uh, again, it's back to Dennis Wheatley's work of fiction there not so long ago, um, Roger Brook, the launching of Roger Brook, which is a fictional account of a, a, James, a young James Bond-type character in, a, in around the time of the French Revolution working for Her Majesty, the Queen of England, right? But, but Dennis Wheatley mentioned in the book that Europe was at fin de siècle, end of cycle, in around the time of the French Revolution, which I thought was an astounding comment. Now Wheatley obviously was in the in the London controlling section. He was close to Churchill and all these, you know, he was he was at a certain rank in the food chain in, in around World War Two. He was within the power structure in the UK, in Britain. So I thought it was interesting as a little insight, even though the the book he wrote is a work of fiction. But at times he lets slip his his worldview 
And that was one of the things he said, that Europe was fin de siècle at, at, at the time of the French Revolution. So in, in the British kind of establishment uh, mindset, Europe was done for, uh, you know, by the turn of the, you know, the 18th century. So obviously they had farm. And it, what he said was there was too many fault lines. You had the Christian, you know, Catholic, Protestant fault line. Yes, yes. And then he actually had what, if I remember his exact words, was uh, Latin versus Prussian. Now, when he says Latin, I, I assume he kind of means Roman. Yes, yes, the, the Mediterranean sort of. Yeah, um, yeah. So, mindset, so yeah. he's, but, but he, so there you have the British mindset looking at Europe said, it's fucked, it's done for, pardon my French, and the, the ironic pun use of the word, but Europe is done for, um, you know, by, by the time the, you know, by the end of the 1700s, Europe's done, mm -hmm. there's nothing, it does, it's not a coherent entity, it cannot realize itself, it can't, you know, it's an, it's a nothing burger. It has no hallmark. It has no spine. And so, so, you know, you can take from that observation of Wheatley's that they had a plan for Europe. They, they had a plan going forward as to, as to what the shape of the world was going to look like. Uh, you know, and, and the question is often asked in these circles, yeah. who are they? Who are they? You know, we're always speaking, who are they? But like they can be, if you looked at World War II, for example, you had an Anglo- American alliance that defeated the Axis powers as such. So you can say right away, well, it wasn't the mm. Axis powers. They're not they, because they won after World War II. So now you're looking at an alliance of essentially Anglo-American and or their Israeli and or their international finance department, some of whom were Jewish, some of whom were Protestant, some of whom were you know, God knows what, and a lot of whom I believe just shared the mask and changed the, uh, you know, put a Renault en engine into a Toyota and put a, you know, put a Ford Mondeo engine into a Jaguar, etc. So, so the brands just, as, just the same as the religions. So you could be Jewish, you could be Protestant, you could be Catholic or change around or whichever engine into any vehicle as was expedient for you to gain a foothold in power. So, you know, th this is another thing that postmodern, post-structuralism, this type of warfare, postmodern warfare has been so effective because it has removed the sign from the word. It's, it's been a linguistic attack on the rational Western mind. It has, it has infected us with this abstract schizophrenia, uh, modern art, uh, warfare. We have we have not been able to deal with it. The Western mind still is having huge difficulty dealing with this this attack because it doesn't have any frame of reference to deal with it because it mm -hmm. it attacks it at its Achilles heel, which is the rational mind, because the Western mind was yeah. built on on rationalism, on the Enlightenment, on the Renaissance, on all that stuff, and that is where it sees us. At, very cleverly as weak because it knew that and i think it was actually khrushchev or some some uh, russian leader actually says the west the west doesn't know what we, won't know what, what hit it when you know what we've got in store for it and this is exactly what he was what they were talking about because you know it's a it's a perfect storm for rationality rationality cannot cope uh, in this in this whirlpool this maelstrom so that's my kind of two cents on it like and i think <laughs> i i'm not sure what the future holds you know if there if there is a counter strategy as such you know not to sound too dark but i'm not sure i mean it must arrive from somewhere perhaps from um the few the few people for perhaps you know who who spot it and who are able to contend with it but I'm not sure how does it manifest. How do you manifest it, a type of a counter strategy? You know, and where would it come from, if 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 at all? It would it would have to come from a, a religious or spiritual revival. You'd have yeah. to get rid of the rational. Yeah. But in that sense, because it's like what you're saying, 
the, the only way the irrational has taken over is due to the rational um, being attacked, yeah. Uh, yeah. facing a sort of disjuncture. Yeah. Um, you know, a, a deconstruction of its, yeah. of, of its uh, you know, supporting frame of reference, its supporting pillar, right? That mm. which holds it up. Um, so, like what you were saying with the, the fin de siècle, um, what has happened is, is it has, that's the way we have been incapacitated mm. um, psychologically and within the, the sort of uh, spirit of the day, right? The zeitgeist. Mm. We've, because they've attacked us via rational, mm. you know, a long march through the institutions which have produced radicals and that has produced radical sermons that have been disseminated and diffused into the, the, the population and the, 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 the collective the collective uh, consciousness of the population population that has developed a sort of uh, ennui uh, you know a mass disillusionment mm. with, uh, with western civilization itself and you know a widespread um, a widespread contagion of cynicism and pessimism. Yeah, yeah. Of course, arguably we are part of that, right? I mean, we are. Si I mean, we ourselves are looking to reform Western civilization, yeah. if not destroy it and start again, right? Yeah. But what what I'm we look at as you know as like a surgeon would look at a you know a gangrenous foot, right? Yeah. Yeah. It just has to be amputated. But what I'm talking about is these radicals, this this form of radicalism, has dis, uh, has infected pathogenically a type of social degeneracy through yeah. the body politic, yeah. which has produced the gangrenous extremity yeah. that we well, now seek to you know amputate. So there's yeah. another another term that I just you know. In my in a workman like way, of trying to understand which you you might be familiar with, probably are familiar with Gestell, which I think is a Heidegger mm. term. And my understanding of it is Gestell relates to technology, and the Bluffer's Guide to Gestell is the given technology of a time affects the consciousness. And the mass consciousness, consciousness is sort of funneled through that given uh, framing. I think it's what the Gestell, the literal term, uh, translation of Gestell is frame. So the technology frames the consciousness. So just to take on your point there of this cynicism and this, you know, the temperature of, of the society around us, we might say is... Um, a corollary of the framing of technology because the technology around us is a machine. It's anti-human in many senses. So it's circumvented our, our humanity and perhaps our spirit to a degree. And that has sort of wounded us. It's left us with a, a soul wound where we've, we've leaked energy. We've leaked our inner spirit mm -hmm. out perhaps so that might be one of the reasons that it's, you know, part of it, as you say, is an attack. Uh, it's a type of warfare, but some of it is what it is because it's this, the way the technology is, has affected the consciousness and the thinking and the being of people. Like, you know, like back to Lynch there, I had a, a look at a couple of his uh, interviews on YouTube, which are, he seems like a very interesting character, very engaging guy. And, he comes across like an, an empathetic kind of guy. But one of the the things he was talking about was he, he was saying, well, why do we have devices? Why do we have laptops, phones, you know? And he, he, was, uh, he had a vision of a future where um, the technology and consciousness will be married. So he always had this, um, how do you say it, um, transhuman, transhumanist uh, uh, vision, you know, a, a little bit perhaps like... Uh, Harari, perhaps, but he didn't come across so mm -hmm. malignant or yeah. bastardly. But like, the, the, but the final point is perhaps the technology itself has created this uh, 
icy kind of, you know, void ar around us, you know. Uh, the thing is marching quicker than we can keep up with it in, in a lot of ways because it, it's we're in its wake all the time. It's, it's hurtling ahead and we've been tethered to it. And um, we're not sure where we're going. It's like the chariot, the horses have bolted and the chariot is, you know, trundling, you know, across the fields and we're just hanging on to the reins. We're mm -hmm. not sure where it's headed. But in, in the middle of all that, we've lost something as well. You know, we've lost some sort of... And at the same time, we the attack is ongoing. So we're sort of getting it from all angles, like, you know, as a society and as a... The species, really, but also from the you know the the, the sort of socio political attack. If we're, if we're if we're correct in our you know in our feeling that the West is under attack and it's scheduled for demolition, and you know the BRIC countries are the the new future, and the the globalists HQ is either you know is going to be China, Russia, Israel, perhaps or you know Brazil or India or wherever. But it won't be here that the the former and this is there's another angle on this, of course, is that there's an inner. I think whether we like it or not, you know, there's a guilt of empire, which was never resolved because we were too busy in the triumph of empire. The West was. So all of the European countries, for example, the European nations that had empire, they profited immensely from that exploitation. So not that I at all uh, concur with this, you know, Frankfurt School, uh, uh, you know, creation of the self-hating white male. I, 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 to me, that's reprehensible. However, however, from even, you know, if you take it from the Irish perspective, empire was yet another huge wound that was inflicted on the peripheral countries. But... You might ask, so so what bearing does that have on, on the now? Well, I think at some level, there's a kind of a, a self-doubt in the Western psyche mm. that all of, all of this is what's happening is somehow the chicken's coming home to roost. But the, mach you know, but the machine is preying on this, this on sensibility. This justification there, this rationalization yeah. of yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's preying on your mind mm -hmm. somehow that, um, you know, you, you weren't complaining when you had Rhodesia or you weren't complaining when you had Jamaica or you weren't complaining when you had the, you know, the East India Company. Yes, it was yes. all rosy then. You know, it was putting red brick uh, factories when they were processing the cotton in Manchester. Nobody was complaining. You all had jobs out mm -hmm. of it. And now you're heading down the sink and you're going to be just like those countries that you ripped off. How do you like that? So I think it's it's there's an element to that as well. That um under un, under perhaps some of the some of the programming of multiculturalism, if you mm -hmm. lifted up the you know if you lifted some of the you know the, the hatches to the and looked into the engine room, you'd see that some of it was was preying on a kind of a latent guilt. Yes, uh, you know a latent kind of a guilt, you know. But our, you know, because you know, everything balances out in, in 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 the fullness of time, you know. So so all of these things are playing out on a kind of a subconscious level as well, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and obviously it's been weaponized with the, the attack on, you know, the white male, as as it were, who is the cause of all of this, you know. Whereas the actual. <coughs> The actual machinery who created all that is still at the top, albeit it has just turned the guns on us. You know, so that's kind of the irony because I think they spotted it. Uh, you know, they spotted it after in around maybe the, the the end of the the nineteenth century. They knew a new model, a new model had to be developed and was going to have to uh, have to be rolled out. Which is in itself is kind of understandable, mm -hmm. and uh, you know it's a big tenant of some of the texts. When the, when you have a new technology, you have to have a new model for running society because it necessarily changes everything. But that's the easy bit to understand, Silas. That the bit that's very difficult to understand is um, this kind of occult, you know, louche kind of, um, you know, huskification and this kind of a. Uh, you know, dawn of the new age of 
serious and all this kind of stuff. I mean, I, I find this difficult to get my head around. It's a lot deeper and a lot more arcane. I think, you know, I know you're a yeah, bit you, more... You, you, you don't necessarily have to um, understand all of that to understand the sort of, um, you know, the processual ideas of everything. So the, the overarching principles behind it. And, and of course, what we observe. So like yeah. what you were just mentioning there. And every, everything that they do is, it's all based around narrative, right? And the narratives mm. of which, of course, we interact with these narratives. We are all almost um, particip participatory agents within them. We, we are actors on the stage. And... <laughs> What it ends up doing is, is like what you're mentioning, um, you know, it, it permits them to justify what comes down the pipe. So what we're, we're, we're in is a never-ending story of power, mm. right, mm. for power's sake. And ultimately, the, the, this is the problem that we continually move through these cycles because we never really learn from any one of them. And it's like what you were mentioning with the unresolved issues that we have regarding empire. Now, of mm. course, uh, Ireland wasn't even involved in any colonization or empire, though they used the, the notions that, well, you know, the Irish uh, emigrated to here, there and everywhere. As refugees, therefore. Well, well, don't forget. Just a quickly interject. I have mm. to, you know, ironically, your man's nickname or your man's surname, Lynch. Like the lynchings of the uh, African American slaves yeah. in America. L Lynch is an Irish surname. Mm -hmm. So, does many an Irish man ended up on the plantation working for, you know, his employers? Be the, the you know the, the the cotton mill owners in Manchester or the bankers, yeah. the Jewish bankers along the Mississippi or the British, you know, colonial landlords of the day. So it's not to say that you know anyone was off the hook, so to speak. But having said it, obviously Ireland suffered in its own way as well under the boot of colonialism and imperialism. But like. The good guys and ga bad guys thing gets very dark very quickly because, as mm. they used to say in the north of Ireland, in the troubles, it's a dirty war. You know, it's a dirty war. So you you start off with good guys and bad guys, and before you know it, you don't know where you are really because exactly, yeah, it's an expedient race for strategic success and mm. um, getting a, a millimeter over over the enemy and making a few quid for yourself and trying to get out the back door with your family and survive. So whatever dark stuff you have to do in the in the meantime, you had to do, you know. So so it's it's never very cut and dry. Um, sorry to cut across your point there, but I think it's no, no. It's well, the, the, this kind of gets back to what um, you you were mentioning Heidegger as well. And this idea of, you know, the Gestell, or I guess the English would be in framing or framing. Mm. This idea that, you know. When technology comes into the mix, and, and really this isn't just about technology, I mean you could actually expand this to just philosophical concepts too, right? Mm -hmm. They end up becoming boiled down into um, general maxims or laws that, again, diffuse through the collective psyche, right? Mm -hmm. Through multiple means, be them parables or analogies or metaphor or even, you know, through literary fiction or what have you. Mm -hmm. So one one example of that is, uh, you know, turn the other cheek, <laughs> for mm. example. And ultimately, I mean, you know, specifically looking at technology, human beings do have, once once we go into this this notion that Technology is a means to an end, right? Mm. And that it it should almost color our existence, and we 
be, you know, we almost become lost in the machine. We fall into the contraption, right? We become uh, the hamster running the cog, which spurs on the machine. We become it's similar to Rocco's basilisk. You know, we almost become the vehicle for its success, for its achievement, yeah. for its literal materialization. We become possessed by it or the thought of it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in this in this sense, you can see what's spurring on. Not just obviously the corrupt leadership now, but what has spurred on every human throughout existence. I mean, of course, we may not even be cognizant of it, but we are possessed by our own gestels, right? Our own framings, yeah, or our own inframing of existence in society and all of that. Um, but uh, very quickly mm -hmm. there, like, yeah. you talk about the construction site, like, the Gestel, for example, the framing of the of the Irish mindset growing up in Ireland at a certain point in time was this is a country you left because there was nothing here, there was poverty, there was no opportunity. And, you know, in, in the 50s, the Irish left for England and, you know, probably the earlier through the 19th century the, and, and before they left for America. So, you, you know, you're brought up with this emigrant, you know, lonesome, mm -hmm. romantic, uh, leaving the Emerald Isle is sown yeah. into the kind of poetry it's and the songs. The and the promised land, art. yeah. But, like, how strange to be on a construction site in the west of Ireland, as I am, and to see so many English lads from Liverpool, from Middlesbrough, yeah. You know, from from all over England, uh, working on the site, and you're going, you're talking to the lads, and you're asking them, you say, "What's why are you over here? Oh, we're making better money here. England mm -hmm. has gone to shit. England's yes. falling apart." And you, I just, you know, it throws everything. It's baffling. Yeah, it's baffling. You're like, "Oh my god, this is like, like you've come to the west of Ireland, which was." The place we desperately were long were trying to get out of, and now you and we went to your country. Now you're back here, telling me yes. your country's falling apart. Yes. So it's like it's such um, that's such a seismic upheaval that you know the, your brain can't handle that because there's never been a song written about that. You don't have a cultural frame of reference for that. You don't yes, have you're a, a novel you're in written uncharted about that. territory. You're, totally. you're, I mean, sight sight. Even psychically, you're, yeah, you're going so, into yeah, a frontier. Yeah, totally. Yeah, there's no sure. way of you can't digest that information. There's no. no like as I said, there's no song, poem, uh, you know, oil painting. We we have know, it here novel. as well. Uh, lots and lots of English. Mm. Obviously, white flight or or yeah. whatever it may be. Moving to uh, well, well, they don't work. Well, of course they work here, but it's mainly to settle down here mm. in Scotland. Which is kind of it's baffling as well because you go into Edinburgh and such, and you hear lots and lots of English accents, and not not just Northern English accents. We're talking, you know, the yeah. south of England, which yeah. of course they may be up here for, as tourists. But um, I mean, even the place I grew up in, uh, it was a sort of farming rural and. Uh, I was there until I was eight, and the the, the small villages round the the sort of larger town, they were all populated by by English, right? I, I mean, toffs. They they spoke, mm. you know, like they had a silver mm. spoon in their mouth. And you're thinking, why are you up here? Yeah. And then and then you you it, of course it didn't dawn on me then because I was too young, but looking back in it. Back on it in retrospect, you see now, wow, yes, that was the fin de siglo, right? That yeah. was the, the end of this, the epoch, the end of the age where we were living through it. There was, you know, a, 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 a dispossession of, yeah. of history at that point. There was a dispossession of culture. Um, and of course, there was a diaspora of all of these people going anywhere they could they could to find some psychic equanimity balance yeah yeah, um, yeah. amongst this this maelstrom of chaos and change yeah. and 
um, really, you know, disenfranchisement, dispossession. And I, I can only imagine, of course, you, you, you've grown up on this, you know, Irish independence and, you know, the, this... Narrative. This I, yeah, this idea that you're the underdog comparative to the British Empire. And, and of course, that, that idea of the British Empire probably still uh, does the rounds through the Irish cycle. Well, this, this is the interesting thing. If, if you're to take, yeah. you know, the current site as a sort of microcosm, you, you've, you've got Irish and British on there. For example, you've got lads that are from Northern Ireland, who I know, for example, would have been on the nationalist side, and both sides, you know, who are working on the job, the, the loyalist and nationalist side. Then you've got lads working on the job who are English, who I know mm. some of them in, in the management are ex-British Army. So there you have the old, how do you say, awkward fault lines. Even they're unspoken nowadays, we've all moved on, you know, but there's, but there's that little yeah. brittleness is still barely perceptible, but does exist. You know, it's like an awkwardness, like a don't mention the war type scenario, but we've moved on. But yet it's, it's sitting like an antique in the corner that has been completely forgotten now because we, we're now dealing with a completely new tidal wave, you know, a tsunami, which makes that antique in the corner look totally irrelevant. Exactly, yeah. So it's, but it's like psychically, as you say, you cannot kind of deal with this on any level because, mm -hmm. like, all I had was my war. Yeah, you're, you know, you're like, still trying to catch up with it. All, so, all I had my, was my own local war, and that was mm -hmm. my thing. That was my other. That was my dialectic. For that was between me and freedom, and you know I understood that. Yet all around me now is a rising tsunami that has completely obliterated everything. So it's like, where does my old war fit? It does nowhere for it anymore. It's irrelevant. It's literally an anachronism. It doesn't belong in this time. Like you know. But so much of my identity was sewn up in that. Yeah. Not me personally, but ones, but perhaps, uh, uh, you know, as you say, the, the social consciousness, some, some aspect of the identity is sewn up in, well, this was the other, this was the, mm. the threat, this was the ex existential threat kind of thing, and the pain and the history and all the rest of it. But yet now you have this completely new mm -hmm. reformed society around you. It's Ukrainian, West African, whatever and a tidal wave of globalism and technology. So there's no way really for, you know, that does not compute. My brain has gone blue screen. I just can't handle it. Like, I don't know how to, see. you know. The, the problem is as well, <clears throat> you have a population collapse as well. So the, see, the, the, the thing is, it's going to take several generations mm -hmm. for... The European mindset, I mean, and of course, I mean, the Europeans by that point will be minorities mm. uh, within the continent. So the European mindset will have to go through a, you know, a, a poiesis, a, mm. a process where the emergence of a new psychic paradigm takes hold. Mm. And I think you're going to find uh, this really where quote quote white didn't exist within the European mindset that we were all you know different right we were all um, our, di our distinctions yeah. were based along national fault lines or historical fault yeah. lines or regional fault lines that will all dissipate I think and I think what yeah. you're going to find is the English, the Irish, the Scots, the Welsh, they're all going to, yeah, they're all going to join. Yeah. Psychically. Just, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And it's like what you've found, but that, that has been produced artificially, or they're attempting to produce art, produce it artificially, where you see this, this well, we, uh, we'll be rebranded as, as whites. Them. We'll be rebranded as whites. Well, yeah, like I we, mean, we already yeah. have, but I mean, just from our own psychic, yeah, uh, perspective. We are going to view ourselves along those lines. We're probably. Yes. I don't. I don't. I don't just mean as an amorphous blob of you know. We, you know, our our skin 
complexion is is our political uniform. That's not what I mean. What I mean is we're going to literally develop our own culture from yeah. that, where we fuse it all together. Um, there will be, you know, the emergence of new, uh, new stories, new mythologies, perhaps even a new religion or a new adapted religion, right? A reformed mm. religion of sorts uh, along these lines. Um, it, it's, it's similar to what's been going on with the, the sort of blacks, right? Or the POC. Uh, what, but of course, that's, that's pushed by the media. Mm. But that, that hasn't really developed here. Not that I've seen anyway. I mean, there's there still... There's a guy who was this, uh, E. Michael Jones, he's, he's a, a priest, Jesuit yeah. educated priest, academic, who is, may or may not be, uh, for want of a better word, a shill, but I, I have read some of his stuff. And um, But he had this thing in America, you know, that you had Irish neighborhoods and Italian neighborhoods, we'll say, for, for argument's sake, in, in the metropolis. <clears throat> mm -hmm. But what happened was, you know, the crime rate has gone up or whatever. And they move out to the suburbs, the Irish and the Italians, whatever, move out to the suburbs. And they no longer, when they move into suburbia, they're no longer Irish or Italian. They're now white. Yeah. They take on yeah. a new identity. Mm -hmm. And like, they're, they're subject to new attacks then as well, you know, because they're now demonized. Perhaps, you know, but uh, as you say, you know, in the future the boundaries will be forgotten that we ever had these, uh, you know, that we ever were English or Irish or Scottish. You know, you kind of made some mention of that there, that, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, those old structures will have been, will, dec will evaporate. But I think that's very interesting kind of a, a, a point because, um, Certain the, the, there's word and there's meaning. For example, like the thought occurred to me today, like conspiracy. You know, there are no conspiracies in the world. Co a conspiracy can only ever be theoretical. You know, it can be a conspiracy theory, but never a conspiracy reality. So the word conspiracy in the English language is actually defunct. It doesn't exist anymore. It's a laughable concept that only insane people spend time thinking about, you know. So there's no need for it anymore. It doesn't exist. So likewise, other other words that you know used to have meaning, like Scottish, English, Irish, French, German, will be. Yeah. They won't exist anymore. They will become meaningless. We're we're marching in, into something completely different now. So perhaps the final assault then will be on any sort of identity that might be along what you might term racial or skin color. Yeah, uh, lines so so white won't exist. No, that that that'll, that'll become a fact uh, due to population. It's, yeah, I mean the population collapse, of course as well. Yeah. I mean even amongst the the immigrant population after the second generation <clears throat> of um, of immigrants, so you you typically find that they are popul you know their their birth rates, they they typically begin to mirror the native or mm. just the general societal birth rates, which of course are low, they're below replacement level. Um but what what you're moving into now is I think this idea of progress and sophistication and all of this, it's going to start gradually waning over time. And mm. <clears throat> You're going to become. You're you're going to see spiritual or religious revival. Mm. Um, to to me, from my point of view, Christianity's dead. Mm. So some there's a vacuum there, and something has to take its place. Now, of course, we still see. You know, the white working class. They are absolutely enamored by football and just mindless sports, but eventually. <laughs> like what we're seeing with the rest of the society, once the economic and societal and political systems begin to, again, through this competency crisis, they begin to gradually decay. And again, that uh -huh. decay also occurs naturally, but this is being accelerated, it's being expedited through artificial means. But once that decay really sets in, 
and they really are dilapidated and they can't support, you know, sports teams and, and all of this distractionism, people will have a vacuum within their life that they'll seek to fill. Mm. And the only way they're going to fill that is through religion, which will lead them obviously to conflict. I mean, ultimately, what does sports do? Sports mm. channel the masculine energies in a safe, prescribed, and controllable manner. They allow competition. They allow uh, males to work together uh, within, you know, diametrically opposed teams. Um, and they value mental and and physical health as well, right? And exertion. So, again, it, it keeps the society peaceable and, or peaceful and it, it ensures that the, they remain docile. So this mm. is why it's always been promoted. Once that goes, once that avenue of control goes, along with the rest of the media um, apparatus, you'll begin to see a resurgence of things like mythology, stories, uh, religion, and of course war. Right, that's is just going to become a, a reality. Uh, fighting, war, conflict, um, a, a, a warrior ethos will take over again. It just it, it has to happen. Um, whether this will happen in twenty or thirty, forty, fifty years, I mean, who knows? But you, you're already seeing a linear trajectory um, leading. I mean, that's the trajectory of travel. In society at present, it's leading to that point. Um, well, it, mm. incidentally, you know, there's a South African guy, you know, working on the job. And I said to him, I was half joking one day, I said to him, How long is it for my country? Turns out like yours. And he looked at me and he goes, About 25 years. Yeah. So, I don't know. I mean, you know, you look at the prison populations mm -hmm. in America and everybody's in there. You know, the Mexicans are with the Mexicans. Blacks are with the blacks. The whites are with the whites. Exactly, yeah. You know, everybody's in their racial corner. Yeah. Because that's I suppose what that's the, yeah. the most primitive, primal exactly. identity, uh, you know, marker that you can have is, is, your, is your, how do you, there's no way of saying it without being politically incorrect, is there? It's yeah, your, your kind your, of your, race and your skin your color. Skin, your skin color becomes your political uniform, yeah. And, and of course, there's there's a greater nuance to it as well. I mean, there's culture, uh, culture and all of this as well. Political yeah, which I think are more important. Like that, that cultural mm -hmm. that German word, that uh, worldview is more important than skin or ethnicity. But it, skin and ethnicity are the marker but when you when you look mm -hmm. past that you see there's a whole there's a whole other world in there that's a deeper mind that's goes back generations and has very very complex evolutionary cultural sociological spiritual yes uh, trajectory of being that goes back you, you know millions of years so it's not just oh you're black and, and I'm white yeah, exactly. There's you've, a whole you've, made other, a, a whole... you've made a profound point there because yeah. the media are attempting to artificially push this onto the blacks to, you know, almost um, coerce them or persuade them to form mm. these sort of, you know, artificial, uh, amorphous racial blocks, right? And it it doesn't really seem to be taken hold. In places like Europe, um, it seems to take hold in, in places in the US because, mm. again, it's, it, it isn't necessarily artificial what the media are doing there. In America, African Americans have that, again, it's not just racial, it's a, it's a cultural thing too, right? So you, you see in Af African American society, not everyone is. is entirely black I mean they're mm. most, most blacks and, and who are considered black in uh, America they have a great deal of white admixture right mm. and there's all different 
shades of tan within mm. that group. But what binds them together is culture. And yeah. again, this is why I think that these these systems of control stemming out of fi the financier class have grasps, grasped and utilised religion. Because religion almost goes beyond racial differences and it allows them to create multiracial um, empires, multiracial yeah. confederations, which they yeah. can, of course, then exploit them, right? Um, under, under the, uh, under, by proxy, uh, well, under a controlled leader. There's some psychological mechanism in a thing like religion, or perhaps even like sport, where it, there's a spasm of the being of the inner will mm. that just by short circuits every other aspect of reason or thinking and it gets rid of the chaos and it just gives a singular moment of you know it, it traps one in the moment it traps yeah. being in the moment and you right. suddenly make sense of things and everything becomes clear and focused through that lens and so this, that mechanism seems to underpin you know, you know, kind of hardline political movements and religions, and you you even find it in sports or people who are obsessed with certain things. It's like, you know, they get this thing into their life, and and it it just makes sense, and nothing, you know, it, and it binds them together with like minded people. And you know, I I, t I thought I saw it one time at a tattoo convention. All the tattoo people seem to have well, yeah, we're into tattoos. We're tattoo people. We have lots of tattoos. We love tattoos. We get together at the tattoo convention, and it was a sign, you know. It's a it. it so maybe, as you said, the the religion. It's something that will it, it it allows one to make sense of the chaos, to drop an anchor mm -hmm. on, in the chaotic seas, and so they know that. I think that the the, the power structure knows that as well. They, you know, the the society around us is increasingly chaotic. Like what I see actually at the moment, and I, I, I don't know if it's at time my own cynical worldview or, or my own inner cynicism, or am I actually seeing it? But I see a very a deadening and a kind of a, a graying, and I see that kind of hyper-normalization. I see yeah. like the manufacturer of normie consciousness in people around me. Yes. And I have to stop myself when I see it because I think, am I normalizing them by looking at them in that way or, or is this the way that it seems to me that my fellow men around me are is just they're like a copy and paste people or they're thinking more in a kind of a uniform manner and there seems to be less of anything that's outside the box well this diet that this, this um, brings us back to our, our overarching point regarding the competency crisis and another thing fueling it is that of course, comp they, they want to mitigate competition, uh, inter-societal competition against their power structure. Yeah. They don't want anyone to shine too brilliantly. No. And of course, the education system is completely mm. uh, yeah. uh, engineered to produce mm. these rather you know, mediocre, mundane uh, students or you know, young adults. Polished pebbles uh, and dull diamonds. That was a Patrick Kavanagh. Like polished pebbles and dull diamonds means you know to get, get make the brightest shine less and make mm -hmm. the dullest polish them up a bit and kind of get them all in the middle. Yes, absolutely. Homogenize them. And this is another thing we're seeing with the impoverishment of people too. That mm. they are the again like what Rome sought uh, to do from that quote. Everyone was a landless peasant by the the late stages of the civilization. Uh, I mean, the the only way really to to over to overturn this, and somebody said, you know, why 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 do you keep making these videos? Um, you're smart enough for solutions. I mean, you can't really have a solution without changing the zeitgeist of the people. So mm. it has to be it's it's a spiritual awakening. Well, look at I, I I actually saw that comment, and I think it. In a sense, it's a fair comment. It's a fair criticism. Mm. But in another sense, as you hinted at earlier on, we're at a certain point temporarily on the spectrum of 
mm-hmm. A, understanding, B, you know, situational awareness and sort of moving on to actually doing something about a thing. So we're at a certain point in time where the conversation is happening and we're trying to establish what has happened and where, where are we like, you know. So that's not to say that, you know, a future generation will bring things on uh, up the ante quite a bit or, or will come up with a mechanism for for change, you know what I mean, or resistance. Uh, so who knows where it's going, like, you know, but, w- but what we do know is that very much that, that things are in motion in the contrary sense. We're a part. We're a part of that. We're we're playing our own small part of that. Like you know. So, but um, as you said earlier on, I think a spiritual. It has to be a spiritual type of, and that's not necessarily not necessarily religious. You know, it could be a Absolutely, sort of a yeah. uh, a mindset. You know what, what? It could be you know what's considered sound. Decent people are kind of a, mm-hmm. a coming together of um, values. It could be a values type thing that you know people say, you know, hey, I'm not going to do that anymore, or that's not how we roll anymore, and we don't care what we're been told. But we've been down that road, and we're just not going to do that anymore because it didn't work for us, or we saw through it. You know, it could be a, a kind of a subtle, a subtle type of thing. It, it actually doesn't matter. I think if it's subtle or if it's violent, so long mm-hmm. as it's it it finds itself. So you know the end justifies the means, but I I think the fact that it's sh- such a kind of a sensibility should come to into existence, and I think is coming into existence. Um, but how how it how it manifests is another is irrelevant. I actually think ultimately yeah. how it how it decides to manifest itself and how to. How to, uh, how to, how its will should manifest is irrelevant. Once it does have a will, because you know, and, and but um, you know, as I look around, I think it's we we desperately need something to to shine some some light into things because things are. Uh, oh, I feel, I feel people are confused, you know, and they're directionless, and you know. You know, for example, one one aspect of an Ireland is drugs, cocaine, ubiquitous yeah. use of cocaine in every town, village. I, I saw it in Dublin as well, uh, yeah. and I'm seeing it here as well in Edinburgh, mm. fentanyl. And yeah, yeah. You can you can see it. The sort of you know slouched over zombies. Yeah, it's. But it's again, it's weaponized. I mean, there are yeah. the powers that be know who's importing it and why it's you know and. You know they've got there's a liberal there's so many angles to it but like it's it's happening so you know easily that it, it you have to assume it, it yeah it is weaponized and you know it was one of the things prophesized in um, New Lies for Old um, uh, I think the the, the author's name in, in a second but um, was it Bezmanov? Not Bezmanov. Yuri Bezmanov. Was it? I don't think it was, but anyway, it'll come to me in a second. But one of the long-range strategies of, you know, the the downfall of the West that was provisionally to come through the old Soviet mechanism and or the globalist mechanism was the control of criminality and drugs is obviously a part, drugs are a part of that. Like so, you know, you mm-hmm. want a society that's completely paralyzed uh, with drug use. If you if you want to take part take a part to society, that's one of the ways to do it. Like you know, you flood the place with drugs. Um, oh yeah, so it totally destroys, um, you know, any any sense of uh, firstly community, because I mean the substance abuse itself, you you almost enter a very almost abusive relationship with it, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. It becomes something that's very uh, personal, and it's, of course, it's you understand on a deep level that uh, what you're doing is wrong, and um, that it is yes shameful. So people end up, you know, becoming isolated from from society, isolated from the community. Um, Galitzin, Anatoly Galitzin was the author. 
Sorry. To oh, and Sol yeah, Galitsyn, yes, yes. So yeah, so, yeah, yeah. It, it destroys society on that level, of course, as well. It, it just utterly eviscerates any chance of that individual having children um, yeah. or a family or working, and it destroys their energy. That's what it's all about in society now, uh, with a, a tyrann usually with a tyrannical. Um, but I think, like I think, the, the smart money is on the periphery and is on the artifacts. That stuff that's going to be hap unpredictable stuff that w will be happening on the sidelines. You know, at stage right and stage left. You know, the, there's factors there that cannot be accounted for because of these forces are so vast. And, you know, they're so compressive that their stuff, stuff is squishing out the sides that would just be completely unpredictable when you're dealing with um, humanity. So I think there's, there's things to watch for. As you say, it could be a spiritual revolution type thing, or it could be something a lot more subtle than that. But, like, it's kind of as if you have to watch on the sidelines for hope. You know what I mean? But I, I, I do think it's there. Like, I think you have to think that way anyway, regardless. You just have to have that mindset. Because if you didn't, you know, you they get you. They win. So you have to keep thinking, right, we're smarter than them. And there's people out there. You know, the, there's, there's a resonance going to go through the social body at times that will be contrary to, to those compressive forces. And... um you know, it could be just a realization of unity uh, amongst people in the West, for example. You know, a, a mindset, even, uh, you know, you get people talking about, well, you know, my friend was such an army, and even they now doubt what they're, what they're told. You know, they got the, the, they did the right thing, what they were told to do during the, the mm -hmm. flu, got the shot and all the rest of it. But even they now are deeply yeah. suspicious. And it could be subtle stuff like that, where even if there's a healthy degree of suspicion, um, that's a good thing, you know. What I mean? mm. uh, you know, there's this, the the sense that the temperature has changed. You can't necessarily believe everything you're told, even if it does appear to be coming from government agencies and or the newspaper and or you know best practice and the what NATO are telling you or, or what the UNHCR are telling you. You may not necessarily have to believe it. You, you know, you got to ask the question. So even it could be something subtle like that that could. But at the same time, I have to be honest, my, my overall my personal mindset at the moment is not too positive about the way things are going. I have to be honest. You know, I don't mean to be a doomer or anything like that, but I, I don't. I just don't have a great feeling. But, 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 but the hope I have is that something is not going to go to plan uh, for, for the bigger movements and that we're going to see stuff popping out the sidelines that that was sort of unpredictable but beneficial for us i i will say i have hope i i, I think and it's not it's not a nece, it's not necessarily a false hope it's mm. it's more i i understand that the change that will have to come to to bring a more you know a peaceful prosperous uh, situation it, it, it's it's going to be, of course, bloody. It's going to be a violent restructuring uh, of what segment of society that comes from is anyone's guess. But yeah. energy is swelling within every demographic of yeah. of Western society, and I think the the narratives coming from the you know the the mainstream they're beginning to break down. Quite considerably, yeah. and new new subcultures are beginning to form. Yeah. Now, yeah. whatever subculture becomes the dominant culture, you know, is is left up to this uh, to speculation and to obviously the 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 trajectory of history. But I think there is change. I think we're in transition right now. Yeah. And of course, it's not it's not good because if you have things you know, left to lose in this society. Um, I, th I think the society is going to uh, go through a, a period of, you know, pretty immense change, uh, changes. So, um, Well, the, the, I remember yeah. it was a term with the British Army had it, the North of Ireland conflict acceleration. 
So, yeah. the, so like, so. the idea being basically, st- pardon the expression, but stir the shit with a view to getting getting something happening and getting things moving and getting things changed. Uh, you know, it, it's moving away from a situation where things are stagnant and kind of at loggerheads and nothing's shifting and just a bad smell in the air. So what you're trying to do is hit the thing a good kick and get something happening somewhere in the corner. There's a skirmish and it just, you know, things start moving. So it's not to necessarily say that violence per se is an end in itself. Or, uh, but from the point of view that it, it may evoke some sort of shift or change, um, that end may be justified. You know, the end may, may be justified by the means in that sense. So, like, basically, if it does kick off somewhere, in summary, we may be better off to see something kicking off than not. Because it, it, it would hopefully get things moving potentially in a beneficial way for all of us. Because at the end of the day, the, the worrying thing is you, you, the individual, or, you know, any of us who are the individual, we are sort of trapped in this society to a certain degree you know you can say i don't i don't take part and i don't go outside i don't mix with people i don't but you're still around it you know you still have to suffer it to to a degree you know it's not necessarily moving at its optimum it's not where you would really like it to be you know so like so but the, the point being that if if it did kick off in inverted commas that you, we might be better off that it did kick off than not uh, exactly. In terms of some yeah. sort of social unrest, or you know, I mean, you know, when when we say warfare, the the model that comes to mind for me is South Africa or maybe Northern Ireland during the Troubles. So mm-hmm. you know, but obviously it's it's violence and it's death. So it's it's a you know it's not well, an optimum. Well, you know that South Africa is an interesting case study because, well, well, for example, I mean the the infrastructure. Has completely broken down in South Africa. Yeah. Mm. The the electrical grid is yeah. you know, partially uh, existent. Mm. Uh, the rolling blackouts here, there, and everywhere. And there's a lot of sections of South Africa, namely the the Boers, the and the mm. Afrikaners, the Afrikaans population. They they ultimately. Uh, from what I've seen, they seem to be there's there's parts of it, especially in the rural areas, they act almost as if they have their own states. They don't really yeah. listen to the South African government. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you, you that's what happens with these types of states, especially multi-ethnic states that are in this late stage phase. The all semblance of order breaks down, which yeah. for us, well, of the- course, is a good thing, you know. Yeah, potentially, if if you can get out the back of it. And Abs- by yeah. the way, there's, there's a yeah. word of warning there for the people who say, yeah, just get rid of the government, man. Just get rid of the government. Because, like, if you were in a failed state, it's not a pretty situation. Like, you could have endemic sort of tribal slash gangland warfare scenario where you need a gun. You know, you're under threat. You don't, you're not living in a secure... I th- some people seem to have a thing that... Uh, if you just get rid of the government, we'll all get along fine. But that's not necessarily the case, you know. That is not necessarily the case. It all depends on, you know, how things are set up, who's holding the reins of power and who's got the money and who's who's got the monopoly on what and whether they're re- willing to share it out because they may not be. You know, you, you know, so the that kind of conflict scenario is okay if you can get out the back of it at some point. I hear people that I work with, for example, from Brazil. It's, it's it sounds rough as hell down there, you know. In so, some places, South Africa, obviously, you know, the north, of Ireland here back in the day, obviously, you know. So. Oh, absolutely, yeah. It's. I mean, when whenever you're in these types of transitionary states, um, it, you know. It can either go very good or very bad. <laughs> so, uh, you know, who who knows? It's 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 up to history to decide. It's uh, it's a matter of fate, I guess. 
Is there anything else you would like to um, state? No, give you the uh, not really, statement? man. No, that, that's that's kind of me. Just I don't huh? know. I don't know what the closing statement is. I, I don't know. I don't really know, man. Things it's seem a strange to be coming. Time. The competency crisis is 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 here. I guess we we would agree, and uh, incompetency seems to be uh, growing day day after day. I think we would agree with that. So, with that, we'll we'll close off the discussion. I just want to All thank right, you for uh, being here, Zeal, and uh, Thanks, giving man. your time so generously. Apologies for any colourful language there. If you use this chat anywhere, but oh no, no, no. All right. There's 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 no uh, <laughs> there's no limit on the colourful language here. Uh-huh. We're all for free expression. Okay. Good night, right, man. man. Take Good care, night. man. Bye-bye. Good talk to you. Take care. Bye-bye. You too, man. Bye bye.